Yeah, so uh, for the folks that's here, we want to see how you all define stereotype. We want to we want to start to get some shared knowledge and language around some of the definitions before we before we get going. So, how do you all define stereotype? That's a great answer, Casper. Uh, <laughs> no, I go ahead. I go ahead. I go ahead. Chime in. Um, I define stereotype as a um, a perceived idea, or a more of a actually like a social. Um, I would say a social, like a, like a greed idea of a certain either ethnic group or just group of people in general. So a perceived or a um, I'm thinking on what I said, right? But yeah, a perceived idea of a, of, a, of a specific ethnic group or people. So, there was, so there's this perception of, mm -hmm. of, of a specific person or, or group. Yeah. What about you, Alex? Yeah, I was going to say preconceived, right? Like this is already like unconsciously there. So I feel like because of the, the social interactions that people have like had as they grow up, it's, it's automatic. And they'll just think a, a certain thing about a certain group of people. So it's preconceived. It's this this idea of socialization, right? And, and and it's unconscious. So a lot of the things that we assume about other groups is very unconscious, and it's a preconceived notion based on based on how we're socialized. So John, if you can bring up that definition for me. And so very similar to what you all said, right? So it's widely held, but fixed and oversimplified image or idea of a particular type of person or thing. So very similar to what y'all talked about. Preconceived notion, it's unconscious, and you know, it's, it has a lot to do with our socialization. And so what about masculinity? What is masculinity? In the words of Dr. Henderson, a social construct. Uh, but um, for me, and as being Latino, right, uh, understanding the machismo, it's the synonymous word for masculine, uh, masculinity. It's just this, these roles that men have been placed with, like, how, how do you, how do I say this, like, kind of the, the attributes a man should have, uh, behavioral, emotional, and mentally. Yeah, so it's qualities, attributes, regarding to the characteristics of men. So you 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 touch that right on the nail. So we know what stereotypes it is. We know what masculinity is. What is toxic masculinity? What is that? John, what's toxic masculinity? Um, <laughs> a myth. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> essentially, essentially, toxic masculinity, um, from what I understand, is all of the negative traits of what men and manhood are. And so it's domination, it dominating women, dominating society, it's murder, it's death and destruction, it's being over sexual, it have that, that hard sexual appetite. But it really just has to do with like dominating and being controlling. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, but, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, yeah, to kind of add on to Brother Henderson's point, I said, right, it's, it's the abuse, right, of the definitions of, the, of masculinity. So literally, if you just look at the definition of masculinity, it's necessarily the abuse of those qualities or attributes, right, regarding as culture sex man. Yeah, and so that's the, that's the definition that we pulled from the Journal of School of Psychology, right? It's the constellation of social regressive masculine traits that serve to foster domination, the devaluation of women, homophobia, and wanton violence. And so it is that domination. It is that abuse. It is the violence that we portray in this negative kind of connotation to almost feel like we are, that folks are inferior. If you are not men or you do not demonstrate the masculine traits, you are inferior. And then as a result of that inferiority, we inflict violence onto them, emotional, physical, mental, verbal, all of those violent traits kind of come up uh, from this toxic masculinity. But then the question becomes, as John said, is, is it a myth or is it, or is this something that's very real, right? Like, is this something that's very real in our society? And so there's some toxic things that folks have said about black men in particular. 
And, and so we're going to talk about that. And we're going to, we're trying to figure out whether it's fact or fiction. Right. So what we're going to do is we're, we're going to go over some, some uh, scenarios, some commonly said things about black men, particularly. Uh, and we're going to look at some videos about people explaining those things. And then you all are going to tell us like, is this true? Is this fact? What do you think about it? Or is it fiction? Is it false? So the first, one of the first categories is relationships and marriage. Particularly, you know, a lot of folks say when black men go get money or become successful, then they go get a white girl, right? And I think this is this is personified none other than than through this this particular video. So we're gonna watch it, and then I'm gonna ask you, like, what do you think about the video? What do you think is it true? Is it fact? Or is it fiction? White women are looked at as success. In America, we see a white woman, I couldn't have you. My daddy couldn't have you. My granddaddy couldn't have you. I would get killed even looking at you. So now, if I play for the NBA, I want them all. So you're telling me, the black woman who has been there for the whole damn time, when we were getting lynched, when we were getting whipped, who was there for us to heal our wounds. If you can give up on a black woman so easily, you don't deserve no other one because you have demonstrated that you can't give enough love to the number one who needs it the most mm. because she has been destroyed the most, rejected the most. She is the number one divorced, last married, most mistreated, and you telling me Thanks. that because now you have money, mm. now I'm free to go mess with the same white woman who helped to keep me in slavery. Selfish black brothers, mm -hmm. selfish who want to come together with a white one as an individual as though she is the epitome of greatness. She's the most beautiful. She has the best hair. She has the best everything. No, I think I take some brown sugar over some white cancer causing sugar any day. I can't have both. <laughs> <laughs> so what y'all think? What y'all think about the video? Fact, fiction, is there some realness to it? Is there not realness to it? What do y'all think? I'm in some realness. Say more. Yeah. I, oh, fuck yeah. I was going to say too. I agree with that. That there was there was some realness to it. I'm not sure how real it is that white whiteness is the epitome yeah. of greatness. But I do think not. I mean, white women being the epitome of greatness. But I do think as a we are socialized to believe that whiteness is the epitome of greatness. And so when we do get that money, we want to attribute ourselves to whiteness in totality, right? Yeah. And that, that goes back to the stereotypes of, of black men getting money, of, of what we are educated to, to perceive and believe. But, yeah. you know, it's not my reality. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's a level of realness to it for sure. Um, not, I definitely don't agree with like the whole concept of, you know, a white woman being placed on a, on a hierarchy, but I, I do believe that there's a lot of anti-blackness um, that was present <clears throat> long before, you know what I'm saying, brothers even get to the bag, honestly. You know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, growing up, you know, one of my idols was, you know, the late, great Kobe Bryant. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, like everything that he did was dope. You know what I'm saying? Even him getting a Latina, like I thought that that was, you know what I'm saying? Like it was, it was, it was, it was something very different about it, but it definitely was something that I, I also like acknowledged and, and, and kind of validated in a sense, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and even in my subconscious, like I found myself being more attracted to Latina women in middle school, you know what I'm saying? In elementary, you feel me? Because I saw Kobe, you know what I'm saying? Shacking it up, you feel me? What a Latina. So I, I definitely think that like that. That representation and us seeing that definitely trickles down um, and, and, and to our, our mind frame, for sure. Okay. What's going on, GP? GP. Dr. Parker? What's going on? Um. <laughs> Howdy. <laughs> <laughs> well, for sure, for sure. Good, bro. Good. So, yeah, I mean, is there some truth to it? Sure. But once again, going back to Jay Reese's terms, we're talking about stereotypes, which are overgeneralizations, mm. right? And oversimplifications. So White women. What's the truth? The truth is that according to, st to studies, 83% of black men that make over $100,000 marry a black woman. That's most, right? The truth is that 88%, 
a married black man are married to black women. And so oftentimes in the media, what we see are the sensational, the sensationalism, the sensational characteristics. They always show the guy that has the white woman, right? But how many basketball players are on the on, on, on a team and how many teams are there in the NBA? Mm. And, and of those that are married, how many of them have black wives that we don't see, mm. right? These are things that we have to ask ourselves when we think and start believing things about ourselves as black men. Yeah. The facts are clear. There are some brothers that go outside, but the majority stay consistent. Yeah. You know what came up for me, John, when you were saying that about sensationalism and like yeah. the, this like fetishization that we have, right? The imagery that came up was that um, like that King Kong with the white woman. Yeah. And we see that moniker or even that imagery portrayed multiple times over mm-hmm. from LeBron. I think LeBron did it once, some other athletes have did it once. And so like you said, we we portray the sensationalism of being with a white woman versus being with a black woman because you know of the stereotypes and the and the toxicity that exists um, to break to break down the black black household. Yep. 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 Can you see this? Hopefully, you can see it. I'm moving it in. Can y'all see that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Know, right there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's real. Destroy the bridge. Yeah. And and, and, it's, and 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 definitely, man, it's 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 a symptom of a larger issue because we all know how 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 much LeBron reveres his wife. You know, what I'm saying? And, his and, wife, right? You know, what he, loves that he loves his wife. How how it, LeBron has been in the spotlight since when? Like 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. You know what I'm and, and, and LeBron and LeBron has never had a a, a scandal. You know what I'm saying? LeBron has never had any type of negative, you know, thing that like tainted his image, especially as a partner and as a husband. And so yeah. I feel like this was perfectly designed. And like someone thought about this and knew where it correlated with, you know what I'm saying? And, and that, that that systematic, like that, like Brother Javery said, like that systematic intent to dismantle the black family. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And, and to perpetuate that image um, that is not true. Real talk. So let, let's do another one. We got a few. Here's this. Here's one that's commonly said: Black boys and men are black males. They're abusers. They go around they're abusing their community sexually, physically, right? And then also, if black boys and men were being abused at the same rate or at similar rates than, than black women, we would protect it. This would have been done a long time ago. And so let's show this video, and you all tell me what you think. There are R. Kelly's in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our schools, in our churches. He represents a thing that we can't touch. We can't stop. We cannot right. We cannot get people to pay attention to the plight of sexual violence against black and brown girls. And R. Kelly is a perfect example of it. Do you think that if R. Kelly's victims were a different race, there would have been a movement that was far more powerful against him? I think if R. Kelly's victims were white girls, I think if they were black boys, that there would be a movement against him that would have that would have started and ended 10, 15, 20 years ago. So what do y'all think? Truth? Fiction. fiction? Tell me why. Why is it fiction? Because black male boys, like, I don't know if there's the, the stats behind it, but I know black male boys are also um, abused at a high rate. And that's the kind of it kind of gets sweeped under the rug or sweeped under the rug when talked about in regards of like child abuse. Hmm. Let me add to your question, John, because Since for me, you, this conversation exists in our workplace right now, right? About right. how if it was a black man, we would be talking about it at a greater rate. We would have done something a lot quicker. And so, do you all believe that? Like, if it was a black male, like if it was black men that were, if, if black men are being abused at a similar rate, why aren't we talking about that more? Or do you all think that we would talk about it more if they were being abused at a similar rate? I don't think we would. And, and my reason is because even within the black community, there's there's a there's still the stigma of just even mental health because you know there's a there's a, there's this uh, narrative of weakness that exists, right? So I don't, I don't think that if the rate, I mean, how do we know that the ratio isn't the same, you know, because men don't want to talk about it. Men don't want to like, you know, express, um, 
the things that have happened or they try to bury it and then it comes up like 40 years later as repressed trauma so no i don't i don't think i don't think it would be because i mean you know i don't know about y'all but you know i've heard of family members in my life who like you know things have happened and they live with that parent still and it's just like you just don't talk about it it didn't happen but everybody knows it and i'm gonna stick to the theme too right your brothers um that kind of that's kind of the negative downside of the toxic masculinity, right? It's kind of, oh, okay, well, he's a boy. He, he can, he's tough. He'll make it through it. And also coming from our, you know, our, it was common place in our communities where, again, kind of the brother George Parker just said, is that we don't, the young males won't talk about their abuse, right? Because of the toxic masculinity, they'll hold that in and just kind of toughen up and deal with it. And then later down the road, they'll find like, you know what? Again, I was kind of, I was, I was abusing, and hopefully they could come to a point to speak out against it. But yeah, sticking to the theme, that's that's right. That's kind of a trait, a negative trait of toxic masculinity is that we don't speak up on these things when we were like, if a brother was abused during those childhood years. So let's do, let's let's uh, let's see. They are our- the truth. This is according to the CDC, right? 9.2% of black women are victims of abuse per year, right? 43% over lifetime, which is a lifetime outcome. We can go over that. Said differently, over 90% of black men do not abuse black women every year. Over 90%. What about, what about black men, though? 9.9% of black men are victims of abuse per year which equates to 39% over the lifetime, right? And black boys have the earliest sexual debut of, out of any other race or gender, period. And that's 10 to 12 years old. So sexual debut means actually having sex, sexual intercourse, right, with another person. And so oftentimes you might hear sisters, and rightfully so, sit here, like, say that when they get 10 or 12 and they start to develop, then they hear more black, you know, black men making nasty comments and things like this. Well, black boys, oftentimes, not oftentimes, but at a greater percentage, when they're 10 or 12, are actually having sex with women. Oftentimes, these are women who are much older than they are. So I don't know, but we don't necessarily, it's not necessarily considered to be, right, rape, even though it is, or sexual assault, even though it is. So he might be 12 she might be 16 or he might be 14 and she might be 18 19 right oftentimes we talk about like you know we got to be aware of that aware of that crazy uncle but while you're so focused on the crazy uncle you look you're not looking at that play cousin or mom's auntie right <laughs> or mom's, mom's girl yeah or mom's girlfriend who's like oh you so grown you so big or you want to be a man right and so these things often happen in our, in our community as and let's just throw out a quick disclaimer because we don't want folks leaving the presentation saying that, well, John Javier said that black men don't abuse black women. That is not what we are saying. That's not what we're saying. Yep. Because that absolutely exists and we recognize that, but there is something else that we have to take a look at and consider, which is the stats that John has just presented us with. Right. Right. What's your thoughts on this, on the on the stats that he just he just presented to you all? Have you all heard this before? I know. I yeah. Um, yes, yes, yes. Again, I didn't know the, the actual numbers behind it, but yes, yeah. I, I, I'm aware of it. Yeah, these numbers is like, man, to actually see them, it hit different, for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You said I, it's from the CDC? Good. Yeah, I got the charts. Oh I, send, I keep the charts on my phone, literally, as screenshots, because... I'm always having these conversations and people want to want to try me. <laughs> I'm staying hey, in references. I already took some screenshots. I ain't going to cap. I took screenshots already. Where's that chart from? From the CDC? The CDC, you know. Wow. So, and they're up to date too, right? And so that doesn't mean that, that we're, not, we're not trying to do like oppression Olympics here. But what we're showing is that since there's such similar rates, it's not because they're black men that they're doing this. It's because of the, the social conditions under which these folks live. Mm-hmm. Right. It has nothing to do with male identity. 
you know. Mm. Lots of times that has to do with many other things. Nine times out of ten, when 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 cops get called for domestic abuse, there's there's also something that has to do with mental health disorder. There's always there's not eight times out of ten. Uh, uh, there's some sort of alcoholic abuse going on. Eight times out of ten, they call uh, what they call it is um, uh, I forgot the word for it, but they're fighting each other. Like it's not like dude is beating up on the one. They're beating up on each other. He got marks too. So there's a lot of things going on in our communities that are left unaddressed and have nothing to do with, you know, them have them being that way because they're black men. Mm-hmm. I'll let you take the next one, Javery. Yep. Welcome to the two folks that just joined us. And so 43% of black boys and black men commit murder. 43% of black boys, black men commit murder. We hear that often often right where we talk about like black on black crime and, and all the crime that, that black men do and how we have to eradicate that and so we have a clip here and we want to you know get you all thoughts on it is this fact or fiction and unfortunately black community create uh, um commits a disproportionate amount of crimes compared to the white community let me tell you six percent of the population right black men six percent of the population account for 44 percent of all murders in this country according to 2018 statistics that is what you call a gap and yet white people white people who represent 60 percent of the population we represent 13 uh black men are six percent uh only uh, represent 50 percent of all the murders right that makes no sense that, that makes no sense a six point variation in a community where we are we are extreme minorities we commit 50 percent of all violent offenses evenly split and we're only 13 percent of the population okay so we have a lot more encounters with police officers and don't say the police officers are coming around because we're black i'm talking about violent criminals i'm talking about murder 44 percent of murders okay you want to talk about real statistics so what are your thoughts here in candace Owen say that What, what comes up for you all? What are y'all's reactions? It's, it's, it's crazy to think that, like, if you don't know who she is, you wouldn't know that she has an agenda already, you know, going yeah. on with like, saying the statistics, right? Um, so that's the first thing, right? Like, we already, you know, for those who do know who she is, right? Yes, I understand she's a part of the black community, but is she really trying to support the black community, right? Um, but for me, it's like, you know, she's saying these statistics because she's trying to, you know, get her, her, um, the, I guess the Fox News and, and that community riled up um, to make the black community look bad, right? And continue the narrative that we continue to hear. Um, but it's ridiculous. You know, at the end of the day, that piece, there are people out there that are like, oh my God, she's completely right. Like, and that's upsetting, you know, at the end of the day. There's some other thoughts. I've seen some folks unmike um, themselves and so. Feel free to jump in. My audio cut cut in and out, so I was unable to hear it. What did you say, George? My audio keeps cutting in and out, so like I, I wasn't able to hear her. But like what I do remember from her conversation is like it. It seems like really, um, uh, what's the word? Like not buzzwords, but she's trying to like she uses like terminology and things that I feel are very intentional to be manipulative, you know? Because she's she's speaking from a um, damn near a fear monger, you know, perpetuating like things that have already existed, but not really actually saying anything new. Because anybody can say, oh yeah, according to statistics, ain't nobody. Who know who watches her for facts are, are gonna verify that, you know? Like nobody, because like it, I'm sure you all are about to show us that like the evidence that she provided is easily refuted. So let's get to the let's get to the evidence. My man John, he was in he was in the lab earlier this week doing some calculations. And he gave us and he gave us some 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 mathematicals on this. Right. And so the truth. 0.035 percent, less than one tenth of a percent of black boys commit murder every year. 
This is the truth. And so just to clarify, she said what she said was true. What she said was that of the murders committed, 43% are committed by black men. That's not that's not false. That's true. But then the question becomes, well, then how many murders are committed every year? Mm-hmm. And there's a, a hand raised, John. Yeah. Uh, George Knight. George, you can unmute yourself, George Knight. Oh, well, I'll yeah. bet. I just didn't want to cut anyone off. And I was going to speak on that anyway because I'm, I'm a math teacher. Um, you know, when people try to use numbers without understanding numbers, becomes one of the worst things that like occurs constantly so like i i know her but anything that pops up with numbers one of the first things i do as a math teacher is i check numbers and like you know with that question just how you um prefaced it was how many murders actually like committed all together and then once you run that down it's like piggybacking off of the other george saying like it's a fear monger it's like coming from a place of already being detrimental and then trying to be quote unquote scientific without really understanding the science or the numbers and math behind it. So I start to use the ignorance of um, things, the fear of people to try to push a negative agenda when they don't even know the whole story. Thanks. Can I, can I, can I add uh, on to Brother Knight's uh, statement? Because uh, the other piece of that, right, is being able to tell half truths. It's like you said, John, like, some of those things, what she said wasn't entirely wrong, but she's not clarifying, right? She's telling a half truth, and by telling that, you omit the facts. You admit the whole story. You just tell enough for your agenda, and that in its own is, like, absolutely detrimental because you're creating your, your, your it's like the, 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 the power of the single story. You, I know you've seen that. So that's, yeah. that's kind of like, that's kind of what it's making me think of. So, we did the math, right? Just like George Knight said, we did it. So, first thing we looked at was the number of murders committed in 2018. That's 16,214 murders, right? And the percentage of black boys that, or black men that committed the murders, 43%. But what's the total population of black boys and men? 20 million. So 20 million, well, not 20 million, but out of the population of 20 million, we, we, have, we can claim 16,214 murders. So let's do the math. 16,214 times 43%, right? It's 6,972. That's the amount of murders that black men, I, I guess, the, that were can be attributed to black men. We take the amount of murders. We divide that by the total population of black men, and we get 0. 0.000386. How many murders were committed by, how many black men commit murders? Less than one-tenth of one percent. By her logic, you'd think we'd all be running around here, <laughs> you know, on some video game, Grand Theft Auto, killing and raping and maiming our communities, right? This just isn't, it's not true. But when you say 43% and you just leave it as blanket, like everybody else has been saying, 43% obviously sounds like a grid. Right. 43% down, that's almost 50%. Like you're saying almost half of the murders committed is committed by, and then you, like you said, you break down how many murders are committed by black men. And then this is not even unduplicated, right? We don't even know if it's the same person committing multiple murders over and over again, right? And that might lessen that number. So. Right. I mean, by that logic, like, have the brothers on this call and kill them. Right. <laughs> have the brothers on this call. <laughs> right. And so, as you all can see, right, we've been, there's there's a lot of things that is placed out in the atmosphere as fact. And we've taken it as fact. But then there's also a lot of fiction to a lot of this as well. And so, if we can get somebody to read the statement below, but before, we, before I get you to do that, I want to say, Black boys, Black men don't succeed in school because they don't apply themselves. And so can somebody read this, this statement under the love-hate relationship with black men? Somebody, anybody. I'll go. Uh, the hate, uh, love-hate relationship with black men. We see African-American males as problems that our society must find ways to eradicate. 
We seem to hate their dress, their language, and their effect. We hate that they challenge authority and command so much social power, while the society apparently loves them in specific plots, music, basketball, football, track, etc. By Ladstrom and Billings, 2011. What does, that, what does that mean to you, Alex? And then other folks can jump in. Like, when you see this statement, what does that, what does that mean to you? We see African-American males as the problems that we seek to eradicate. I think because, um, I think it's two things for me, right? Uh, one, I'll, I'll say as a Latino, right? Exactly how people love to get their, their fresh fruits and veggies in the, in the, in the stores, but they don't want to recognize that Latinos are doing the, you know, the farm work, right? In the hot sun. Same thing with this, right? It's like, we're going to appreciate all the beautiful things that the black community is giving to the culture, but when they start, when other people of other races start culturally appropriating, they're like, no, 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 this is good. Like, I'm appreciating what you've given me. It's like, no, like, you're not giving true love and, and respect to the people that have created these certain things for society. Absolutely. Somebody else uh, jump in. What, is the, what does this statement mean to you? What does it, what um, does it mean? What's your reaction? Um, honestly, it's, you know, as it goes with anything, relationships, anything involved, you have to take the good with the bad. And even with the bad, you figure out and understand to understand why the bad occurs and then fix why the bad occurs, not just get rid of the thing that you are quote unquote saying is bad. You know, like, you know, when I think about this, I think of just in general, I think of my students. Like one thing that a lot of people look at me sideways is I never say there's any such thing as a bad student. Like that's to me, that's irrelevant. There's a student that's misunderstood. So if you take the time to understand what or why it is misunderstood, then you eradicate, then you get rid of the reason why it's misunderstood. So then the student is able to be there. And to me, especially like with the black men, you know, we, we go through a lot of traumas that go untouched, go um, unaddressed. And, you know, when you combine it with toxic masculinity, you know, you easily get caught up in this situation, a, a cyclical nature of being stuck and not knowing how to get out. And, you know, with nowadays, the instant gratification phase of things, it easily piggybacks on a lot of the negative things that we see. And that's what we perpetuate because, or that's what we get stuck in trying to perpetuate because that's the only way we see as quote unquote getting out when it's not true. Absolutely. Can we get, uh, I'm going to pick on Muhammad and George Parker because they was going to say guys. So if y'all could jump in, jump in here as well. Well, I guess I would say, um, I mean, what, what is there more to add? Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's been said. I mean, I always, so, okay, as, as a higher ed professional, what this, this kind of like gets to me at, like when I think about this, is like, you know, when they do diversity hires in higher education, particularly in student affairs, and they, they hire people on so they can say, yeah, we're diverse, we care. And then what they do is they don't create, they, they don't create a system that allows for these individuals to be retained because you have racist faculty and like, you know, you have racist staff members who are not educated. You have people at the top who are like, look, we hired you with that. And then you have your, their peers and their colleagues, you know, encouraging them to like, oh, support the black students, support, you know, the students of color. And then it's like, yeah, they do it. So they're overworked and underpaid and they don't, uh, they're, they're not in an environment that supports their growth or their retention. And I was looking back at it the other day and I was thinking like, so what's the difference between that and slavery? Like, cause I'm missing something. Cause if you're going to overwork me, underpay me and expect me to be the, the emotional guy for a young black man, but not provide a space for me to be a black man, then look, what, what you're just using my body. So, and you know, the whole thing with Tana AC Colton, he talked about the, in between the world and me is that, you know, the black body is the most underappreciated thing in the United States, arguably the world, because people claim ownership over it rather than allowing the people who inhabit it to make the decisions for it. And that's kind of what I get from this. Cause like they want your body, they want you to fit the mold that they have in their mind, but they don't want you to have your own mind. 
I want to, uh, John, before you jump to the next uh, slide, I want to ask you something because we just heard we just heard a few people talk, right, and, and say something. And one of the words that stick out to me is eradicate. And from the three people that we've heard talk, we haven't heard them like their reaction to the word eradicate. So are we so socialized to know that the that our society is is that we're okay with the the thoughts of being eradicated now? Can I speak to that, Doctor Bayless? Go ahead, bro. So, so I would say yes. I, I would say like it, it is just such a part of the norm. We're desensitized to it because like when when someone talks about eradicating black men, like I'm like yo, I know that's the plan. That's the plan. I I I have. I, I, you know what? I'm gonna let someone else speak because <laughs> I'm I'm getting hot. <laughs> And I guess that's what I was looking for, right, John? I think that, like, every with everything that we have presented so far, right, we, we talked about the stereotypes, we talked about masculinity, we talked about mascul uh, toxic masculinity, and all of those things have been portrayed in all of the things that you have, you have showed, right? right? And then we get to this one, and it's like, well, we know that they're the problems, and so we want to eradicate them. Right. And it's almost like by any means necessary kind of situation, right? That's what it is. I think that's what it is. Oftentimes when we talk about racism, and I'm just going to say this, I'm going to get in trouble, whatever. We, we speak about racism in a very passive, in a very, I would say, also feminine kind of way. So, for example, like whenever we talk about racism, especially in academia, we talk about it as social and emotional death. Mm -hmm. Destroying my spirit my emotions, all of these things. Racism is about physical death. Physical death. But oftentimes, the individuals that experience immediate physical death are black men. We talk about law enforcement, right? When we talk about, and, and if we don't, and if we can't kill them, then we incarcerate them, mm -hmm. you know? Or, if we're talking about academia, they only want a certain kind of black profession. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You ain't going to get no tall, dark skin brothers with an attitude in, the, in, academia, in academia. You better have some glasses, Jay, you know what I'm saying? You better, you <laughs> don't be fit. I have you to disarm so you. Like, I have to do everything that I can so you, so you can feel disarmed. And so right. that you feel safe, right? And so if right. we don't fit into these slots of what they are considering fact, music, basketball, football, track, the things that society loves from us, they are looking for ways to eradicate us. Not only are you looking to get to to milk us from every, everything that we have, but then you're also looking to eradicate me. Right. That is right. wild. Right. And and thing I didn't mention before as well, even going back to that idea of toxic masculinity. You know, if you go back in the history and look at where that term originated, it originated from a book called Masculine. Uh, a woman named R.W. Cobb in 1993, right? In her book, if you go to her methods section, she looks at Australian white boys <laughs> and their process of becoming men and then coins the term toxic masculinity to describe their process. What we did was then we took that term and then applied it to all men. Like it was something that we all just do. If people would have flipped and turned the chapter in the book, they would have read her actually say that black men, she calls them outgroup males, but black men, Latino men, Asian men, do not, cannot be recipients or cannot practice toxic masculinity because they do not have the power and the privilege to do so. And that black communities need to be able to define term, define things for themselves so that they can understand what's going on in their community. So it's not them being toxically masculine. It's that dude is hungry. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so I need to go and, and handle my business so I can put food on the table. It's that I, I was, and it's that dude was sexually assaulted as a child, so he goes and sexually assaults his sister. It's a product of society and the things that we deal with. It has nothing to do with this, this male identifier. Nothing to do with it. It's the conditions and socializations, for sure. Right. So, uh, let's let's jump to the next slide. 
And so, as John said, he he just laid this out for everybody, right? But here here's the truth for all the black men and our Latino brothers that's on this call. Black males are not the problem. You as black men that are on this call, you are not the problem. Our society is the problem. The conditions, the environment, the socialization that we have been so ingrained to endure and come to understand is the problem. The systems that are in place is the problem. Society has an invested interest in stereotyping black males. And that is what we are here to break down. Go ahead, John. I said I should have put eradicated. I'm going to change that word. Yeah, yeah, you should have, because that, that's what it is, right? It's, it is this eradication. And so here's our reflection. We gave you all a lot. And for, for some, this could, this could feel hurtful. It could, feel, it could make you feel sensitive. I know I kind of feel a little sensitive right now, just a little bit, like I'm not even going to hold you. Like after we then already created this presentation, we're like, ooh, this is the one. But now reading it and being in the space, it's like, ooh, hold on. This is that's a this is big, like to to break this down a little bit further. And so we want you all to reflect with this. And in this reflection, if you have the capacity to do so, you could do it with a notebook. Um, you could take out your phone or in your notes, piece of paper, however you want to do it. We want you all to write who are we and what is our truth. Who are we and what is our truth? Because what we're trying to do is, I don't want to use the word redefine. What's, a, what's another word for redefine and reframe, John? Reframe, what are you talking about? Redefine, reframe what? We're, we're reframing this idea of what it is to be a black male, right? We're redefining what it is. But I don't want to use those words because that means how about that we're, how about, um, how about we are reclaiming our narrative? How about we are asserting our own narrative? We are asserting our own narrative. Because you don't need to redefine anything. You can yeah, have that. Like if we put the re in front of it, it means that it was never, it was ours at one point in time, and we're looking to take it back. It has right. never been ours, right? Right. So we're looking to assert our narrative. And so in this assertion of our narrative, we want you all to identify who are we and what is our truth by answering and responding to I am fill in the blank. I value fill in the blank. I want to protect fill in the blank. I want to become fill in the blank. And I am doing this for fill in the blank. And so take some time to just jot that down and then we'll come back in a few minutes, give some folks time to think and process and then we'll share those out and we'll, we'll talk through that. I am fill in the blank. I value fill in the blank. I want to protect fill in the blank. I want to become fill in the blank. I'm doing this for. How much time do we have, uh, John and Leo? Yeah, I have until 115, but we can go over. Yeah, let's do like a like a like three minutes, you know, three four minutes. Welcome, Brother McCone, into the space. Peace, peace. Take a few more seconds to get that to get that down, get that in. 
I am filling the blank. I value. I want to protect. I want to become. I'm doing this for. And so uh, let's, you know, for the sake of time, let's kind of see if anybody wants to fill in safe or fill in bold to, to jump out there and share theirs. Um, I can share mine. And then, oh, go ahead, Leo. Yeah, uh, I'll start. Um, and again, I appreciate you, brothers, for, for sharing this space with me. Um, and appreciate you, Brother Javery and Brother Jonathan. It was profound. Um, I, I'll start by saying I am at peace. I value my self-worth. I want to protect my village. I want to become the best version of myself. And I am doing this for the legacy I want to leave. Mm. Who else feels open to sharing? Go ahead, Alex. I'll go next. Um, I am a warrior. Uh, that's literally the literal transition of my last name. I value growth and prosperity. I want to protect those in my familial circle, which is a very small circle. I want to become generational impact, and I'm doing this to break my generational trauma. Go ahead, George Knight. Um, mine's a little long, but I am the sprout that my ancestors planted. I value growth, forward progress, and changing the narrative. I want to protect my peace, my family, and my legacy. I want to become a change in perspective, and I'm doing this for everyone who I encounter to spark change. Mm. Anyone else? George said no. Uh, yeah, I would like to go if I can. Go ahead. Um, I am a son, a brother, a Christian. I value kindness and entertainment. I want to protect my family. I want to become the ultimate includer. I'm doing this for my brothers and everyone connected to me. Thank you, Maurice. And so I'll, I'll jump and go, and then John, if you want to go, and then we can close it out for the sake of time. For sure. So I am Dr. Javier Bayless. It feels wild for me to say that. <laughs> I value my spirituality and family traditions. I want to protect my family. I want to become a, hus a, a, hus a husband, father, and provider. And I'm doing this for those who come after me. And I am a third generation Henderson black man. I value my wife and my family, my community. I want to protect my truth our truth and our legacy. I want to become the best person that I can be, somebody that my ancestors would be proud of. And I'm doing this for the community, for the people. So, so uh, yeah, and just kind of to close it out, when we talk about asserting our narrative, you know, just taking themes from what you all just said, if I were to turn this into like a qualitative study, say that, that black and brown men value family. They value legacy. They're concerned with growth and progress, both personal and professional, right? They're concerned with personal development and always want to grow and become a better person. They're committed to their community and they're religious and spiritual. That's what you all talked about. And if you do study, and if you look at the studies that actually ask black men what they're interested in, you will find some of the same things. Nobody wants to be a white man, right? Nobody wants to, to rape and pillage. <laughs> black men are black men, and they're not toxic. You know? um, anything that you, you, you'd like to close with, Jerry? Definitely not adding more to that, because I feel like you just added it. But what I, one of the things that I do want to say is, that our, our contact information is, is in the chat and we can place it there again. And we know that this was a short amount of time to talk about blackness and maleness. 